He holds all things, all things, all things together. Good morning, happy Resurrection Sunday. We miss you all so much and we love you and just um, we're gonna praise the Lord this morning and we just wanna encourage you guys to, to praise along with us in your houses. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all the
sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' slain. Happy Easter, Lakeside. It's a privilege to greet you on this Resurrection Sunday with the good news that He is risen. One of the things that I will miss the most on this day is being able to hear the congregational response that Christ is risen indeed. 
And although we can't hear one another, I still hope it is an encouragement to you to say it in your own home, out loud, the good news that Christ is risen. When I thought of that and the missed opportunity to hear your voice in response, my mind went to scriptural promises that encourage me in the truth of who it is that we celebrate this morning has risen. And so when I asked the question, who is risen? These were several scriptural truths that came to mind. Who is risen? Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is risen. Jesus, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He is risen. Jesus, the one who taught with authority and perceived man's thoughts. He is risen. Jesus, the one who is gentle and lowly in heart and offers us rest for our souls. He is risen. Jesus, the one whom the devil fled and the demons obeyed. He is risen. Jesus, the one who turned water into wine and fed thousands upon thousands. He is risen. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. He is risen. Jesus, who said, this is my body broken for you. And this is my blood poured out for many. He is risen. Jesus, who prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He is risen. Jesus, who was the Word from the beginning, with God and was God. He is risen. Jesus, of whom all the law and the prophets spoke, he is risen. Jesus, the heir of all things and the radiance of the glory of God, he is risen. Jesus, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, he is risen. Jesus, the one who humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He is risen. Jesus, the one before whom every knee will bow. He is risen. We celebrate that in a unique way this morning. And I'd like to go back to one of the earliest accounts of what happened on that resurrection morning in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And I invite you to follow along with me in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, as we read about what happened early on that morning that gives us the reason to celebrate even today, 2,000 years later. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee 
that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. It's an amazing story. And one of the things that we're reminded of as we read about what happened that first resurrection morning was that even the closest followers of Jesus were struggling to believe what they were experiencing. We encounter in this brief passage the unbelieving followers of Jesus. It sounds like an oxymoron, but the women who went to the tomb, Luke makes clear, were on their way to the tomb out of respect for Jesus' dead body. It was their desire to anoint his body appropriately for burial. There hadn't been time on Friday to do it before the Sabbath day. And so they were now coming at their first opportunity to anoint the body of someone who they loved. They were not expecting a resurrected Christ. And they were wondering on the way even how they would possibly get to his body, knowing that there had been a stone rolled over the entrance of the tomb. And then we see that even after they'd been told the good news and they went and told the disciples, that the disciples themselves struggled to believe that this was really true. That Jesus was risen from the grave. Now their struggle in believing this was not like many of us now in the 21st century who might just struggle to believe anything that we hear that sounds miraculous or non-scientific. No, they all believed in miracles. They believed and had seen Jesus' power. So part of, for them, why they struggled to believe was not a lack of faith in God or any lack of belief in the supernatural or the miraculous. They still struggled to believe that he had risen because they had all just witnessed what only a matter of days before Christ had gone through and experienced on the cross. They saw the crucifixion happen. They saw the shame in it. They saw the pain and the agony of it. They saw the torture that Christ had experienced. And in their minds, for that to be so fresh and recent, it was hard to believe that he was already risen that he was already healed and already made right because so much wrong had happened to him. But they saw the crucifixion. They couldn't deny it. They were shocked by it. And that's something that's important for us to remember on this Easter Sunday. The crucifixion really happened. The good news that Jesus is risen is not that in the story of the Gospels a number of bad things happen, but eventually at the end we realize it was all just a dream and everything that we thought was bad never really took place. That is not the good news of the resurrection. It the bad news really happened. 
The pain was real. The grief was real. The sorrow was real. In this pandemic that we're all experiencing together, there have been some unique and creative ways that different artists have uh, released their great work to the world, accessible to anyone from their home. Uh, and for our family, our kids have uh, one of their favorite children authors has been doing a drawing lesson every day that they've been able to watch online and then work on a piece of paper themselves and take advice from someone whose books they enjoyed reading. Uh, the author is Mo Willems, and one of the books that our kids have, which they love, is called I Will Take a Nap. And the first character says that he wants to take a nap, and then he's interrupted by another character who says, I'll join you in it. And it becomes the series of conflict between the two characters where you think the whole time that one is disrupting the other, only to find out at the very end that it was all a dream sequence. And in fact, the, the first character who wanted to be sleeping was sleeping all along. And so that's given in my boys this, this sort of imagination that if you, if you put something in a dream sequence, really anything can go and anything can happen if at the end, waking up basically becomes an eraser to all the bad that just took place. And for many of our stories, we're thankful that finally somebody wakes up and the bad things never really happened. But the good news of the resurrection contains within it the truth that this wasn't a dream. Christ really did die on the cross. His tears of agony in the Garden of Gethsemane were real. His tears and weeping over Lazarus at his tomb were real. The sorrow that he felt for the crowds who were like sheep without a shepherd were all real. And it's good news to know that this wasn't just a dream sequence because it means that we have an understanding Savior of the world. And as we are now in this unique time experiencing the hard truths of the pandemic that is gripping our world and different cities and hot spots are seeing people die at unprecedented rates. There is a part of us that would wish that we could all just wake up and find out that this was a dream. But every day we wake up, it comes home to us that this is not a dream. That very real and awful things are happening. And all of the things that we read about in Scripture that happened to our Savior were real. And He understands the pain and suffering of our world. He allowed Himself to feel the full weight and the force of it. And so our Savior doesn't come to us in our pain and in our suffering and say to us, well, just get over it. Or just pretend like it never happened. Or realize that one day you'll understand it wasn't that bad after all. No, that, that, that's like nails on a chalkboard to a grieving heart and soul that knows real pain and loss. Instead, our Savior comes to us in the good news that he has risen from the grave with the truth that the pain, the pain that comes from death and the loss and the grief that we feel from injustice and the brokenness of this world and the seriousness of sin is in fact true. That he understands our tears. He understands our sorrow. He was acquainted with our grief. And so for his earliest followers who in fact saw how much of it he went through himself, it was hard for them to believe that he in fact so quickly could be made whole. That he could be risen from the grave. 
because they could not deny the suffering and the agony and the pain of the cross that he endured. And so for them, when they finally were convinced that this was true, that the tomb was empty because Christ was alive, well, then they knew that he was the undeniable victor over sin and death. That for him to be able to rise again and be made whole, to speak with them and to comfort them, to no longer be uh, bruised and bloodied in such a quick period of time, gave them the confidence that he was victorious over sin and over death. If you still have a Bible open in front of you, if you go just a little bit further into the chapter of Luke 24, you'll see how Christ himself speaks to them directly. Beginning in verse 36, those who were in route to Emmaus came and told the disciples what they had experienced in encountering the risen Jesus. And then the disciples were talking about it is where we pick it up in verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? It's a, it's a beautiful description that Luke gives us. While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. It would have been hard for any of us in that moment if we had seen what Christ had gone through. Even though he was in front of them, healed and risen to believe it. And it was for them, like it is for us, something that we can't fully explain. But when we come to trust in the truth of it and the goodness that that means for us and this world, we don't have to understand it fully to begin to celebrate it, to have joy, to marvel that we serve the one who, in his rising from the grave, has been victorious over sin and death. Not only for himself, but for all who come to trust in him. And that's eventually where each of the gospels conclude after the good news that he is risen. The disciples, once they finally come to terms with what has happened and how good it really is, that the one who is risen is the Savior who loves them, who understands their sin and their pain and their suffering and that he has been victorious. That now there is the universal invitation to eternal life. This Jesus who rose from the dead was the same one who in his earthly ministry was willing to serve Jews and Gentiles who was willing to call tax collectors and religious zealots to be his disciples, who could cleanse the lepers who were no longer welcome to gather together in worship and restore them into the full fellowship of God's people. The same Jesus who spoke words of grace to the woman who was caught in adultery And a group of people wanted to stone her to death. It is that Jesus who is risen from the dead. And as he loved in his life universally and indiscriminately, 
his victory over sin and death is now to be announced to the world universally and indiscriminately that his sacrifice for our sin is sufficient for the whole world. And we still have that opportunity and that privilege and that calling even in this moment in time. While many of us are constricted in our movement and in our travel, there is no constriction and no limitation on the appeal of God to humanity to announce to the world the hope of eternal life. It's something that we can do in a text, in a call, in an email, in a video, walking around in our neighborhood, or maybe you're considering this for yourself even as you listen to this message now. Is the good news that Christ is risen good news for you like it was for those disciples it's meant to be it is something that you can trust in that we now celebrate in spite of the brokenness of this world in spite of the reality of sin and the suffering that we experience even in seasons of pandemics and profound loss and pain As Christians, we don't deny any of that. And we believe that our Heavenly Father knows and understands what it is like to grieve the loss and the pain of our world. But we are also thankful that He didn't leave us there. That He didn't simply enter our story only to suffer alongside of us. But on this day, we celebrate that he also was victorious for us. And that he gives us hope in the midst of this world. So that we have the resources we need to shine as lights in this world. To be on the front lines of caring for those who need to be cared for. Helping the vulnerable to feel safe and secure and coming alongside those whose pain is real that they might not even have the words to adequately express. We are thankful for the resurrection of Jesus. Not because it erases all of those things that happened and says pretend like they never existed. but more like an unfolding story turns from one chapter to the next. We discover that what we thought was the end in fact was another beginning. That Christ is able to do new things and create new realities and possibilities so that the pain we do experience and the sins that we have committed do not have to become the final end or destiny of our experience. And we're thankful for that hope. And we pray that you, if you do not know that hope in this day, that as you might be realizing that there are not other places you can put your hope in, that ultimately we cannot place our hope in our government leaders or in our job security or in our future plans, that we can place our hope in a Savior who understands our pain, who has been victorious over sin and death, and who generously offers to us the hope of eternal life. Would you join me now in a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for the good news that we celebrate, that Christ is risen, that all of the suffering and injustice that he endured was not the end of his story or his ministry, but that in ways that surprised all of the earliest witnesses and followers to those events, that none of us even have the appropriate words or categories for, that Christ has been victorious over sin in the grave. And we pray that you would give that amazing truth a fresh experience in our own hearts on this day to help us to trust that you know the real pain of loss and suffering and death. That you understand what we experience in the frailty of our flesh and in the brokenness of this world. And we pray that you would assure our hearts in fresh and new ways that you have been victorious and that with so many changes that we are experiencing and limitations that we feel that we can rejoice in this day of the limitless nature of your love and the unending joy and hope that you offer us in eternal life. We thank you for all of this and ask your grace and mercy to be upon us in this time that we can be lights in this dark world, that we can be on the front lines of loving our neighbors and our communities and our country and our world and supporting those who are making sacrifices for others who they don't even know, who might never even understand the level of sacrifice that was made. Father, help us to be your hands and feet that bring assurance and comfort to weary hearts in this day and to point them to you as our only hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. All in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on Him was laid here in the death of Christ I live 
built in life No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From lies to sky to final breath Jesus commands my death He is risen. Who is risen? The one who promised to never leave us or forsake us. He is risen. He holds all things, all things, all things together.